what's underneath the underneath? Now, if you are a little bit of an anime fan, like I am, you might recognize that phrase. That's something that Takashi Sensei likes to say in uh, Naruto, what is underneath the underneath? The ninja always tries to understand. So what are we gonna talk about? We're gonna talk about exploring the deep sea floor and the subsea floor. And the subsea floor is probably something you haven't even thought about before as like a possibility. Well, you're gonna hear about it today. So get ready. As you might have noticed throughout camp, you know, the lectures are all basically each of us coming to say like, hey, hey, yeah, yeah, you wanna study this, don't you? Isn't this cool? Well, I'm here to shamelessly do the same thing. Okay, so here's, here's just some cool memes. I think the ocean has some really, really awesome memes. And I just found this one on the left the, yesterday about uh, the surface web, deep web, dark web, the big fin squid being the page two of Google and the goblin shark being page one of Bing. I thought that was pretty good. Um, but why don't visit the ocean? We've got angry boys. We've got crazy lamps. We've got hot things. The ocean has everything and we don't understand it. And remember like two years ago when for about a week we all got into sea shanties? Um, yeah, that's why I put that, that one on the bottom left there because you should get, you know, when you get sad, you get on a boat about it. That's kind of what we do in marine science. Okay. So now that I've shamelessly said that I'm trying to turn you all into ocean scientists, what do we think about when we think about the ocean? So a lot of us probably think about scenes like this. You know, we think about snorkeling. We think about coral reefs. We think about out here on the west coast of the U.S. We have kelp forests. So we think about kelp forests, maybe. Um, you know, I'm from New England originally, so I think about cold water. Um, it's not cold everywhere, but it was cold for me growing up, and I can't swim in warm water. I actually don't really like it. It's like being in a bathtub. And, uh, um, so this is what we think about when we think about the ocean, but is that what most of the ocean actually looks like? Well, well, no, because light only penetrates the first 200 meters of the ocean. So most of the ocean looks like this. Most of the ocean is dark, okay? And there's no light below 200 meters, okay? And then um, it's very cold, okay? The, the bottom of the ocean is about two to four degrees C. Okay, most of it's covered with some kind of sediment. Um, so this doesn't really look like, you know, what, what we would expect, right? Okay. Uh, and then also at the, at the bottom of the ocean, uh, the average depth of the ocean, um, the, the pressure at the average depth of the ocean is about 370 times what we experience at sea level, right? Okay. So that's like putting a rhinoceros on your big toe, because your big toe is about a square inch, right? Okay, so imagine having rhinoceroses piled up all over your body. You're not gonna survive that, or if you are, you're going to be very, very flat. So anything that lives in the deep sea has to be well adapted to this kind of scenario. It's cold, it's dark, and boy, is there a lot of pressure. Okay, so you've probably seen a lot of things like this in the media over the last eh, like five years. You know, how little do we know about the ocean floor? Oh, it's so hard to make maps that of the ocean floor that are detailed. And why do we know more about Mars than we do about the ocean floor? How much have we actually explored? Okay, so these are these are very compelling uh, 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 the headlines, and then you see images like this. You know, where it'll, this is a meme image, of course, and it says the moon's surface 100% mapped, Mars's surface 100% mapped, and the ocean floor 5% eh, mapped. Okay, so how true is that? Okay, how true are these images that we see floating around on Twitter and Tumblr and, you know, other social media? You might say, Katie, this map exists. Clearly, we have mapped the seafloor. What's this 5% garbage, okay? So here's the issue with this map, okay? This map was created by a satellite, okay? So when we map other planets, we use radar, right? Okay, and we, we send a pulse out and we record how long it takes for it to come back. And that tells us, you know, what the topography looks like, okay? And you might say, well, can't we just do that 
with the ocean? Like, why can't we do that? Well, the problem is that there's, there's water in the way. Okay, so electromagnetic waves do not like to go into water. Okay, so if we have a satellite up in the sky and they send out a, you know, an electromagnetic wave, it's just going to bounce off the surface of water. And so we're not going to really be able to get a whole lot of data. But this map exists, you say. Katie, this map exists. It has all of the mid ocean ridges, it has all these trenches, it has seamounts. Okay. The problem with this map is resolution. And we'll get to that in a second, but how this map was made is because it turns out gravity, okay, gravity is not continuous over the entire uh, uh, surface of the earth, which is not a sphere, it is an oblate spheroid. It is slightly squashier at the equator than it is at the poles. Um, so gravity on the earth, actually you get little mounds where there are high points, in, in the seafloor and you get little dips where there's low points in the seafloor. And so basically the, uh, the satellite can distinguish these very, very minuscule differences. And we're able to take the data from the satellite and run them through an algorithm and basically say, okay, we get this, this map out. Of it. So yes, this was created by a satellite, but it did not actually penetrate the water surface. Now, the problem with this map is also resolution. Okay, so each pixel in this map is five kilometers by five kilometers. And you might think that's pretty good considering how big the earth is, right? The problem is, is that anything that is smaller than five kilometers is not going to show up on this map. Okay, and so you can imagine that this excludes a lot of very small scale um, surface features on the seafloor that might be important for a variety of reasons. And so I'm going to show you an example of this. Okay, so this was the base map in an area that we were working in a few years ago. So this is just the existing uh, bathymetry, the existing seafloor topography in this area. And this is an outcrop called Dorado. It's off the west coast of Costa Rica. Shout out to Costa Rica. Um, and uh, we wanted to go out there and study it. But the problem was, was this was the map that we had. Okay, now this is not gonna cut it if you wanna do some science. So we took a robot with us and we mapped the seafloor over the course of a few weeks. And it turns out that it actually looks like that. Okay, so you can see this huge difference. I'll go back and forth between the two uh, pictures. So you can see, you know, here it's it's blobby. It might be connected in the middle. Eh, we don't really know. Here you can see the distinguishing features of this. Uh, you know, you can see all of the little peaks on the top of this outcrop. And this outcrop, if you look at the scale, pretty small. So this this outcrop would not have showed up in that satellite map. Okay, the existing map we had was just from uh, ships. You know, ships driving around, and so we had a little bit of data, but not very good data. So this is really important because if we don't have good maps, we can't do good science. And we can't even figure out what we want to do if we don't know what the seafloor looks like. So we need to understand what the seafloor looks like at some kind of usable scale. Okay, this map, for example, has a sub one meter resolution. So I forget if it was 50 centimeters or what, but it was it's pretty small. So you can imagine that all the features that are you know, down to you know, a meter or around a meter are going to be represented in this map. So how do we map the seafloor in a useful way? So we use sound, we use sonar, okay? Originally, we started out by towing these systems behind the ship and we would mow the lawn, just like you, know, you mow your lawn at home. You drive back and forth and back and forth over an area. And you can see how that's, that's going to take a lot of time, right? You know, because we can't drive that fast because we can't collect data that's good if we're going too fast. Um, and then we also, let's say instead we wanted to, you know, actually see what the bottom looked like, you know, as in pictures or in video. So instead of towing a sonar array, let's say we towed a camera system like this picture on the right. Uh, this is the Argo system. This was actually used to find the Titanic in 1985, okay? Um, so basically what that is, it's a camera on a multiple kilometer long string and you're driving around with that. And so you can imagine, again, you have to drive even slower because 
if you can't even see what's on the bottom, then what's the point of even having the camera down there if you're driving too fast? It's just going to look like you know warp speed lines going past. Um, and you also have a very narrow view of the bottom, you know, because like I said, the bottom of the ocean is dark. So we have to bring our own lights with us. And so we have to light the seafloor. We're getting a very narrow uh, view of what's down there. And we have a relatively limited range, but that's because of the time and the expense. So what do we do now? That was how we started out doing this. What do we do now? Now we use ship mounted, multi-beam sonar systems, okay? Now, uh, these are cool because they can emit a swath of sonar, okay? And so we're getting returns from an entire swath of the seafloor underneath the ship. So we get a wider range. Um, we are still somewhat limited. We're limited by where research vessels are going in the ocean. So some areas have better coverage than others, just because we, you know, we go back there to study. Um, some places also NSF like doesn't let us go. Like, for example, if we wanted to, um, you know, go some parts of the Indian Ocean, we're not allowed to, to work in because of the, the issues with pirates. Um, this can also, this method also can be expensive, um, mostly because of the time. Ship time is also very expensive. I'll, I'll talk about that a little later when we uh, get into the specific vehicles, but there has been a concerted push in the scientific community to map the entire seabed and to do it by 2030, okay? And this was started about maybe five or six years ago. It's called Seabed 2030. Um, and the goal of Seabed 2030 is to map the, sea, the entire seafloor at a usable resolution um, and to then make that map you know, publicly available. And it's, you know, of course, be usable for science. And um, because if we know what it, you know, what the seafloor looks like, we can, you know, create questions about, you know, well, what's going on? Why does it look like this? You know, um, and, and allow us to, to create more uh, scientific questions. And that's where the, being the creative comes in. Because, you know, someone's not always going to hand you a project. You know, you have to come up with this stuff yourself. Okay, so this image is, it's mostly correct. The, the moon, yeah, that, that part's right. Mars, yep, that's right. The ocean update, we are about 20% now, okay? And so we went from five to 20% in like five years. So I don't know if we're gonna get it done by 2030 unless we really ramp up um, the work that we're doing, but it is possible, fingers crossed. It would be nice. Okay, so let's talk about exploring the seafloor. Okay, so how do we do that? And we're gonna do, we're gonna talk about these different types of vehicles in order of uh, less to more human involvement, okay? So the first type of vehicle we're gonna talk about is uh, autonomous underwater vehicles, okay? These are literally robots, okay? These are systems that are pre-programmed. You know, we have the system on deck, we program, you know, we program its code, we tell it, this is the mission you're going to go out and do, we put it over the side, and it swims away and it does what it's going to do. And then, you know, we come back later and pick it up when it's done. Um, we're also able to communicate with it during its mission. So we can, you know, kind of check in, see how it's going, if it's in the right place, um, you know, correct things if we need to. Um, so these are, these are very, very cool because they can go out and do work while we're doing something else. So it allows us to, you know, uh, use our ship time more wisely because we could be do, doing two things at once. Okay, so the one on the left is um, Sentry. It looks like a Tic Tac. Um, it's owned by the Woodsall Oceanographic Institution. It's one of the better known and uh, most used uh, AUV systems right now, um, at least for deep sea work. Um, on the left hand side, these are more um, these are more targeted systems. So the one at, on the top is a wave glider that's owned by uh, Mumbari Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. And the cool thing about wave gliders is that they can collect data. And you see, it has a solar panel on it too, so it can make its own power, which is really helpful, right? Um, so it can collect data in the atmosphere and at the surface of the ocean at the same time. And so you get this really nice combined data set that looks at the interface between the atmosphere and the ocean, which is a very, very important thing for us to study. 
especially in the context of climate change and carbon cycling. Okay, and then the one on the bottom, the one that looks like the missile, that is a large water sampling AUV. So we can deploy that and send it out and say, okay, well, you know, go to these coordinates at this depth and get a sample and then go over here and get a sample. So it can go out and do sampling for us without us having to go out and do it ourselves. So it makes our job a little bit easier and we get more samples this way. So there are a lot of these uh, systems that are out there. They're currently under heavy development. Um, Seabed 2030 is using a bunch of gliders to do um, some of the, uh, the bathymetry mapping work. Um, so this is a really expanding field. If you are interested in engineering, I cannot highly recommend ocean engineering enough because everything that they are doing is cutting edge and is very complicated uh, uh, conditions that you have to deal with. Um, so it makes it very, very challenging. Okay, so we've got the autonomous vehicles. Oh, this is very cool. Okay, so part of the Sentry team, one of the guys on the Sentry team, one of the programmers, um, his name is Justin, that's him up in the, in the top left. His part of his job is totally to put a face on Sentry every cruise they go out, okay? So he'll find like a theme of the cruise. So in the left, uh, he dressed uh, Sentry up like a knight because they were testing a new um, instrument that looked like a coming out of the front. It looked like he was jousting. Um, so they, they turned him into a knight. And then on the right, we were out at Christmas time. So of course, Sentry became Sentry Claus. Um, and that was, and they're always really cute and charming. He's done, you know, Wonder Woman. He did Moana. Um, it, it's different every cruise and it's always really fun. But when they interviewed him, part of the interview was literally, so how are you at making faces out of duct tape and electrical tape? And he was kind of like, but he's really good at it. He's, it's, and he's a really awesome engineer too. So like very, very integral part of the team. So there's a lot of fun that happens within these uh, groups also. Okay, so something really cool that uh, Sentry has done in, uh, in recent history, this is within the last few years, is uh, my colleague Dave Valentine at the University of California, Santa Barbara, was doing a cruise to the uh, channel in between Catalina Island and uh, LA, and they were just doing some bathymetric mapping with Sentry, and they found all these targets, and they were all these, you know, hard bottom spots, and they went back with the ROV, and lo and behold, they were barrels of DDT. They were not rocks. They thought they were rocks. Um, and so this, this is one of those scenarios where we wouldn't have known that this was there. These were dumped in, we think the 1960s, um, unknown by who, if it was state government, federal government, I am not sure. Um, so now the question becomes, okay, you know, we've made this map of where all these thousands of DDT barrels are, you know, we have to clean them up. And that's, that's an ongoing thing that's going to have to happen. It's not as simple as just going down there and picking it up. Um, although that'll probably be the start of it. So AUVs can make, you know, very significant discoveries, you know, usually completely unintentionally. They've, they've also been used to look for like missing airplanes. Um, you know, they were involved in the Malaysian uh, jetliner crash a few years ago. They looked for um, the El Faro in the Caribbean a number of years ago after that went down. Um, they were involved with the Deepwater Horizon. The it list goes on and on. So now let's talk about ROVs. Okay, so we get a little bit more human involvement. So these are remotely operated vehicles. Okay, so these are vehicles that are connected to the ship by a fiber optic cable. And um, they're controlled by a pilot on the surface and uh, go down and collect samples and um, you know, do all kinds of science. Uh, and the nice thing about these is that they can stay on the bottom for a really long amount of time. So think about it, an AUV has a battery, so it's kind of limited by its battery power, right? Well, since we're with an ROV, we're connected to the ship's power. So we have functionally an infinite power source. So we can stay on the bottom for you know, many, many hours at a time. Jason's uh, record, uh, dive length, I think, is like 95 or 96 hours on the bottom. And you just rotate through your personnel. You work four hours on, then you get eight hours off, come back for four hours, then eight hours off. Um, 
So these are some of the, the kind of key ones that you'll hear about these days. Jason on the left, which is owned by Woods Hole, um, which is part of the National Deep Submergence Facility, um, which is the, the scientific resources that are available um, for deep submergence in the community. Uh, on the bottom right, that's Keiko, which is owned by Jamstack. Um, and uh, I got very lucky. I was able to go on a cruise on a Japanese ship, which was awesome. It was very, very cool. And then on the upper right is Hercules, which is owned by the Ocean Exploration Trust. And I'll talk about that um, a little bit more later. Okay, so let's see if this works. Okay. Come, come on. Come on. Uh oh. Why is it not working? Uh oh, well, that's not good. Well, moving on. Anyways, so the thing about ROVs is they're deployed as a two body system. Okay, so there's, if you think about it, the boat's jumping around and it's on the waves and all of that. And, um, and so the, the ROV, if it was just connected directly to the ship, it would also be bouncing all around. Right? Um, so we, what we use in between the ROV and the ship is we use something called a clump weight or a drop weight. Um, which we also lower down, it's connected to the ROV. And that is kind of like the heave compensator, okay? And then so that the, the ROV can, can um, drive around more freely um, and not be affected by the effects of the waves. Now, the probably the coolest part of using ROVs is because we are connected live to the seafloor, okay? If we have adequate internet, we can broadcast those dives live over the internet to the public, okay? And so this is a really valuable science communication tool, okay? One of the issues historically with marine science has been, it's hard to bring people with us when we go to sea because, you know, we're out in the middle of nowhere, we're gone for a month, um, you know, we don't maybe have great internet connection in the past. Um, and so, and we're limited by the amount of space we have. So we don't have that many, you know, spaces that we could bring people with us. Um, and so telepresence, uh, which was coined by Bob Ballard, um, who found the Titanic, if you were not aware, he also is the head of the Ocean Exploration Trust, um, who has a goal of exploring the seafloor. Um, telepresence is basically to inform the public about uh, the seafloor. And so there's a bunch of groups that are doing this right now. I included a screenshot of the Nautilus Live website. Um, I also made some QR codes that you can scan later. Um, the one on the bottom right is for the Nautilus Live website, and the two on the left are for the Twitter accounts of Schmidt Ocean Institute and uh, the NOAA Ocean Exploration uh, group. And they, they go out more sporadically. Um, Nautilus is out basically for the entire summer. They're in Hawaii right now. Um, they're mapping some basically unmapped seamounts um, in one of the remote uh, marine protected areas off of Hawaii. So this was really important work. And this is great because we can share it with everybody. You can ask questions. Um, there's narration um, so that you know what's going on on the seafloor. Um, so you know what the purpose of their expedition is. Um, so like, you know, if, if I'm working at home, I'll put on YouTube on my TV and, you know, just be watching the seafloor from wherever they are, um, which is really great. And it's a great way to, you know, learn something about the seafloor, you know, in, in a slightly less academic way than like, you know, taking a formal class. Okay. You know, so it, it's very accessible. It's a great, it's a great situation. Okay. So here's the really cool stuff, right? So I won't lie, diving in a submersible is the coolest thing that I have ever done, like hands down, like there is nothing that has come close to this. Um, so human occupied vehicles or submersibles, um, you know, this is a really iconic image I have here. This is, you know, William Beebe in 1934, you know, just decided, all right, you know, we're gonna make a steel sphere and we're gonna get lowered down into the bottom of the ocean. We're gonna get lowered down into the ocean on a rope. 
And, uh, and that's what they did. And that's essentially what we still do minus the rope. Okay. So Alvin, which is owned by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, or excuse me, it's owned by the Navy. It's operated by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. We still have to follow all of the Navy rules. Um, it has uh, the RV Atlantis is its uh, mothership. And uh, Alvin is, is it, it, it's phenomenal. I can't even, I can't even get into it, it how cool it is. It's, it's just so cool. So we, uh, here's the specs. It's big, it's really heavy. Uh, it's about 20 metric tons. Okay, so just imagine trying to lift something that is 20 metric tons off the deck of a ship into an ocean that is, you know, not calm. It's not flat calm. There's waves, there's stuff happening. Um, and then to get it back on, on deck and hopefully the, the video will work when I try to show it. Um, the, uh, the, the pressure hull is about 4.8 cubic meters. That doesn't really tell you anything. There's a picture there. That is actually the old pressure sphere. Um, we are in the middle of actually recertifying the submersible. We went through a $25 million upgrade. Um, we have upgraded, we got a new titanium sphere that has more viewports. And um, wood. Does she say our wood is um that freaking sick then? What I bring and I become a teacher. I don't really hear you. Okay, so anyways, um so uh so Alvin is uh yeah, so we have a new titanium sphere. We're in the middle of recertifying it. Alvin used to only be able to dive to 4,500 meters, okay? And that allowed us to access eh, about 60% of the seafloor, okay? When we complete this uh, recertification and upgrade, they're actually in the Puerto Rico trench right now, diving, trying to get to 6,500 meters because there's no pressure vessel available anywhere in the world that you could fit all of Alvin in. It's 7.1 meters long, it's big. Um, so the only way to test it is to dive, unfortunately. So they're kind of teasing out, you know, minor issues as they go. Um, but once we, once we complete this certification, we will be able to dive to 6,500 meters, which is 95% uh, of the seafloor. So we will be able to access much more of the sea floor. And like I said before, if you can't get there, you can't study it. So this is gonna allow us to study so much more of the sea floor than we've had access to before. Okay. And uh, oh, so the best way I can describe a dive in Alvin, okay? We get in the water at eight in the morning and we have to be back by 5 p.m. Navy rules, okay? So you're in there, you're, it's like nine, 10 hour day, right? Okay, so you're in, the best way I can describe it is going into a broom closet, okay? With two people who you don't know very well. And one of two things is gonna happen over the course of that 10 hours. You're either going to end up being best friends or you're going to end up hating each other. Most of the time you end up being best friends. Um, so in, in the picture here, this was actually my very first dive back in 2007. Um, that's me on the left and my colleague, Bob Meldrum in the right from, uh, in the middle from Canada. And then on the right is our pilot, Mark, and who is actually now my boyfriend uh, many, many years later. Uh, so <laughs> kind of funny how things happen. So here's a cutaway of what it looks like inside Alvin. It's actually really hard to take pictures in Alvin that show kind of the, the spatial uh, setting of it, because it's just very small. It just, it, it all just looks cramped. Like I said, it looks like you're in a broom closet. So what are some of the other, uh, what are some of the other things that are really important about uh, the submersible? One of the things is the sample basket, okay? We can take 400, uh, 400 pounds of stuff. So that's either instruments that we're taking to the seafloor that includes samples, so rocks, sediment cores, water samples. Um, we can take a phenomenal amount of physical samples and put them on the basket. And we use those two manipulator arms that are on the front 
Uh, these are hydraulic manipulator arms and it's really neat. They use this like little joystick thing that looks like it has a wrist and an elbow and, and a forearm. It's really cool to watch the pilots use it. They're very, very good at it. Um, you can also see in this image that we have five viewports. We have three forward facing viewports and two side facing viewports. And I have to say, now that I've used both ROVs and HOVs, um, doing, doing visual geology, doing anything where you actually have to, you know, look at something and create a spatial perception like you do in field geology, um, having human eyes on the bottom of the ocean, physical human eyes, not just a video, is so important. There have been places I've been to with both systems and, you know, maybe I didn't get it the first time, but then as soon as I dive on an area, I can put everything in perspective and say, oh, okay, well, this is how it all goes together. And so it helps me as a scientist to actually be there. And so I know there's a big push for like, oh, well, you know, we don't need to put people in the deep sea. Well, you know, we kind of do. There is no replacement for the human eyeball. Okay, so how do we get to the bottom? We use gravity. Um, that's the, we just physically drive down. We strap these scrap iron weights. And I know you're probably thinking, oh, Katie, that's terrible, you know, leaving, leaving weights in the ocean. Well, we don't really have a choice at this point. It's either have a longer dive or, um, or you know, be, be slightly less eco-conscious. But at least there's a ton of iron in the deep sea already. So the stuff we're leaving there is non-toxic. It's iron. It's going to be reduced by uh, microbes and uh, the natural processes in the deep sea. So for now, this is the best we can do. So I'm hoping this is going to work. These work when we test them. Here we go. Oh, good. So here's the time lapse of us launching Alvin. Okay, and I want you to look at the thickness of that line that, that's going up and down there that they use to lift the submersible off of the deck. It is 20 metric tons, okay? This, the A-frame that they used to lift this is ridiculous. The amount of engineering that had to happen in order for this to basically lift it off without compromising the stability of the ship. Um, so let's see if I can play it again. It's really short. Maybe? There we go. So, uh, so it, it gets wheeled out on these railroad tracks and you see the stairs on the left side of the video. Uh, the scientists go up the stairs, go across the little bridge, you go down through a hatch, they close the hatch, you get lifted off the ship, and then you dive. Basically, we are positively buoyant at the surface, um, and then we flood the few ballast tanks that we have, and we start to descend. And so you heard me mention a little bit about, you know, using ROVs versus a submersible. Now, is there a, a, a situation where you would prefer to use an ROV? And yes, there is. So a number of years ago, uh, Jason was in the Western Pacific and uh, they were diving on an area that they knew was an active volcano. And so, you know, they were kind of expecting stuff like this, you know, pillow lavas and things like that, a quiet eruption. Well, then they came upon this and it, this is a violent explosive eruption um, we knew these happened in the deep sea, but we had never observed one before. Now, if we had been down there with Alvin, this would have been an immediate abort the dive, okay? You can't have people in this kind of a situation. It's super dangerous. Um, the number of things that could go wrong is longer than my Christmas list. Um, so, but because we were there with an ROV that does not have people in it, we were able to stay at a distance and we were still able to record this amazing footage, okay? And at one point in this cruise, you know, Jason actually sat down in what ended up being essentially elemental sulfur that caked all over the bottom of the vehicle. It was super heavy when it came up. They got it on board and they had to chisel all of this stuff off, okay? You can see why some of these scenarios would be super, super dangerous. Also, the time aspect. So if you have, um, you know, if you need to stay on the bottom for a really long period of time, you're going to want an ROV, okay? Because you can have a 48-hour dive, whereas with Alvin, you, you get 10 hours and that's it. You know, that's it. So, okay, so 
you've seen that accessing the seafloor is hard, right? Okay. So how do we access the sub seafloor? Okay. And you're, you're probably just like, what? Like, why, why would you even want to do that? Number one. Um, but how do we get inside it? How do we get inside this, the seafloor and why would we want to? Okay. So how we do that is scientific ocean drilling. Okay. And this is not oil. I'm going to make that abundantly clear from the get go. We are actually not allowed to go anywhere where there is a you know, possibility of any kind of hydrocarbons. We have to do pre-expedition uh, pre surveys to make sure that there's no danger there because we are not equipped for it. Um, so the ship on the left is the Joides Resolution. Uh, it's a scientific drilling vessel. Uh, the one on the right is owned by Japan. It's called Chikyu, which means Earth. Uh-oh, my internet connection is unstable. That's not good. Um, Hopefully it figures itself out. Um, so what do we do with these ships? Well, we're able to drill into the sediment. We're able to drill into the ocean crust. And why would we want to do that? Well, the ocean sediment is basically the history of the oceans. Okay, so we can look at the sediment. We can find out, you know, what was the climate like, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of years ago? What was going on uh, on the planet? functionally at the time. So it's, it's a vast history of the planet contained in the sediments. And when you get into the ocean crust, this is very cool. I'm sure most of you have heard at least, you know, from National Geographic or something about hydrothermal vents. Well, turns out, and if we were all together, I would have a fantastic piece of porous basalt, uh, like the one on the upper right here to pass around and you could all look at it. It turns out that the ocean crust, which is made out of basalt, is very porous, okay? And so that allows seawater to percolate into the crust. And you see all these question marks on this diagram because we don't actually know like the direction, the pathway of this fluid flow, okay? So we, we just know it happens. We don't know how, but we know it happens. Um, and so this fluid flow uh, has a bunch of different functions, okay? And it, you know, it can mine heat. It can mine heat from the cooling crust. It can uh, transport metals. It actually, hydrothermal circulation is responsible for some of the major elemental ratios that are in the ocean and why they have been per so persistent and constant over millions and millions and millions of years. Things like the ratio between calcium and magnesium. That's controlled by hydrothermal uh, fluid circulation. And the entire ocean actually circulates through the mid-ocean ridge hydrothermal circulation system. I want to say it's it's once every, you know, 80,000 years or something like that. It's very fast. It's faster than you would think. So that's the entire volume of the ocean. Okay. So there's this reservoir inside the crust that we don't know anything about because one, it's hard to get there. And two, it's hard to sample it. Okay. So this is what hydrothermal fluid flow looks like at the surface, right? Okay, so here's a hydrothermal vent chimney. This is an area that I worked in for my PhD. It's a sedimented rift area on the Juan de Fuca Ridge. Um, this was, I was not on this dive, unfortunately, but um, th this, this chimney is normally about a meter tall uh, and they came back and uh, it was suddenly 10 meters tall. So clearly something had changed to induce all of this excess venting and formation of this chimney. Chimneys actually form as the minerals precipitate out of the solution as they hit the cold water. Okay. Uh, so the temperature of this is about 270, 280 degrees C. So it's not one of the super hot ones, um, but it's pretty hot. Uh, it's covered with beehive structures, but this is what we typically think of when we think of hydrothermal fluid flow. But why is that important? Okay, so the problem with it, or the why it's important is because we don't understand it. Okay, so fluid flow in this porous layer is super influential, but it's really poorly understood. Okay, and we really don't, we haven't quantified any of the parameters that have to do with the circulation at all. Um, certainly not at a large scale, very, maybe at a very like vent size scale, like a couple hundred meters, but not any bigger than that, okay? So I want you to look at your cell phone, okay? I know we all have one. Um, 
And I want you to think about this statement. If you can't grow it, you have to mine it, okay? And I think we have forgotten in this day and age that there's a lot of stuff that we build that is based on components that are mined, okay? I live near Salinas, okay? Salinas is a major grower of lettuce. Next time you buy a bag of lettuce, look at where it's from. If it's from Salinas, that's about a mile from my house, okay? Now, if you can't grow something, you have to mine it. Think about drywall. Drywall's made out of gypsum. Where do we get gypsum? We mine it, okay? So just these things that we don't think about, all right? So think about your, your iPhone or your, you know, your cell phone. You know, there's a ton of mined metals and rare earth elements in a single smartphone. Now think about how many millions of smartphones are in the world, okay? And you start thinking and you start seeing the scale here. So, and these aren't just, you know, typical things like gold and silver and, you know, there's neodymium in there. Like, and this is mostly having to do with the battery systems, but like there's a ton of metals in there that you would not expect. So here's, here it is for an iPhone 6. I'm sorry I couldn't be more certain, but it's probably similar, okay? So cobalt, copper, gallium, okay? Lithium, okay, lithium, is a hugely crit contentious critical metal, okay? We call these critical minerals or critical metals because these are metals that we will need to have in order to supposedly get a green revolution happening with all of these batteries, okay? Well, the problem is, is that most of the places that people want to mine for, in for lithium are either areas that should be protected or are indigenous land which is not okay. And we do not have a good re uh, record with mining on indigenous land. Just look at the Navajo with uranium mining uh, at the advent of the Cold War. Um, so you can see how there's this dichotomy of like, well, you know, we need all these batteries and all this stuff to go green. Well, but yeah, if we have to ruin everything to, you know, be green, is it actually green? So some, something to think. Okay, so when we put sediment on top of the uh, warm ocean crust, turns out sediment's a really good thermal blanket, okay? It's cold, it's wet, um, and it does a really good job of keeping the fluid inside the ocean crust, okay? So it can keep circulating around inside there for a really, really long time, and it doesn't have anywhere to get out except maybe at some of these little outcrops, these little pieces of rock that stick up above the uh, sediment. And that's what we were doing at Dorado. We wanted to see if Dorado was one of these places where um, low temperature hydrothermal fluid was coming out after it had been circulating around in this crustal reservoir for however many thousands or millions of years. We don't know what the residence time is. That's another really fundamental thing. Um, so yeah, so we can have this kind of outcrop driven flow. Um, which is, a, so why would we want to, you know, why do we want to look at that? Um, well, if we want to look at this, this long-term, these kind of long-term studies, we need to have something that sits there for a long time, right? We can't just keep diving, you know, every single day for five years. There's no way anyone would fund us to do that. What we can do, we can establish long-term subsea floor observatories, and these are called corks. Okay, and this is a case of backwards engineering of the acronym. Uh, CORC actually stands for Cir Circulation Obviation Retrofit Kit. And that means that you've stopped circulation and you've done it after the fact. Um, and you could, or you can install this after the fact. And what this allows us to do is we drill through the sediment into the basement. We put in this plug that has all these instruments in it and we can monitor what's going on inside the crust over like, you know, decades if we want to as long as we're willing to keep up the system. So they're big, okay? You can see the, the scale, the people on the, in the picture on the right, that's on the drill ship, uh, that's assembling them. That's the part that sticks up above the sea floor that we can access and you know plug things in and download data and things like that. Um, they take a long time to assemble. They're also really expensive. Each cork costs about a million dollars. Um, they're not cheap. Um, so getting them funded is somewhat difficult. Um, 
So we set out an array of these on uh, the Juan de Fuca Ridge, um, basically to look at uh, this outcrop driven flow. Okay, and uh, we did a lot of really cool science here. Um, we were able to look at and see the direction that fluid was going. We were able to perturb the system ourselves and see what happened. We actually did, um, well, it's in a couple of slides, but you'll see, uh, but we were able to collect data over long periods of time. We can collect pressure data. We can find out what the pressure is inside the seafloor. Turns out it responds to tides just like the seafloor does. So just as the seafloor is loaded with tides, the, the, the ocean crust is too. If you think about a dry sponge, okay, you can, you can kind of squeeze a dry sponge like a little bit. That's kind of like how the ocean crust acts. It's a little bit compressible. And so as the loading of that water column bears down on the sediment and pushes down on the rock, you actually see these pressure responses, which is very cool. We're going to skip that for time. Um, so and, Yanda has up. We have 10 minutes till we go ah! to the Q&A room. Okay. Well, we might go a few minutes over because this is really important. Okay, we can also do long-term data collection um, using uh, Osmo samplers, which use osmotic pressure to draw fluid into um, a, a, a narrow bore tube. Um, so we can actually get like, you know, divide up, you know, okay, here's uh, chemistry from you know Monday and here's chemistry from Friday, um, so we can get a temporal uh, picture of what's actually going on. Okay, and we did a we basically did a giant groundwater test at the bottom of the ocean, which had never been done before in 2010, and it worked. Um, it did what it was supposed to. So these these systems they're complex, they're they're big, um, but they can really give us a lot of data. There's a huge return on the investment. So why do we care about the seafloor? Specifically, why is the deep sea important? So you might have seen this this comic before. I don't know why I don't care about the bottom of the ocean, but I don't. And it's these you know high society ladies who lunch, you know, talking about the ocean. And you might hear things like this, but I don't live anywhere near the ocean. How can my actions affect the ocean? Well, there's the watershed of the Mississippi River. So. You could be in, you know, Idaho, and well, maybe not Idaho, but you're definitely in Wyoming, um, and and your your actions are in the ocean, and in turn, the ocean affects us. Okay, so thank you to those of you who filled out my survey. I appreciate you. Um, so we did get. So these are some nouns. These are the things that you said that you associated with the deep sea. Okay, like anglerfish. You know, all these things. These are all. Maybe not Atlantis, because you know, that's, at least to our knowledge, that's not a thing. Um, these are all great reasons to want to uh, to want to uh, study the ocean, to want to understand it, uh, to want to respect it. Um, and then for adjectives, um, dark, yes, mysterious, yes, it's very mysterious, very unknown. I hope for those of you who put scary or terrifying. I really hope that I've changed your mind today, at least like a little bit. It's it's not it's just really cool. It's it's not so much scary. Um, dangerous some places, yes, not so other places. Um, so thank you for participating in that. I appreciate that. Okay, I want to show you this. We all came from the sea, and it is an interesting uh, biological fact that all of us have in our veins the exact same percentage of salt in our blood that exists in the ocean, and therefore uh, we have salt in our blood, in our sweat, in our tears. We are tied to the ocean, and when we go back to the sea, whether it is to sail or to watch the going back to once we came. Okay, now, somebody's going to get 50 faction points if they know what 90s TV show that was from. Um, so what a lot of people don't know is if JFK had not sadly been assassinated in the 60s, that he wanted to create basically an ocean NASA so that we would, you know, have the ability to do what we do now. And some people say, well, you know, that's Noah and it's, no, it's not. Noah's 
encumbered by other things. And plus it's in the commerce department, which is like not ideal. Anyways, so why should we care about the ocean? I mean, the obvious things are like microplastics, litter. Um, the one I really want to get at here that is super important um, because it's going to affect us in our lifetimes is deep sea mining, okay? And you might be thinking, oh, that's like, you know, that's like 20 years off. Like nobody's, nobody's even thinking about that yet. Unfortunately, that is not the case. There are a number of Western Pacific nations who have been interested in mining polymetallic nodules. These are sometimes called manganese nodules, although they contain lots of other different um, metals. They are precipitated from the ocean, okay? They, they take millions and millions and millions of years to form, okay? And um, so we, somebody back in the, in the 70s did an experiment and they said, well, let's, you know, let's do it and see uh, if we can, you know, let's, let's pretend that we're gonna mine some nodules and see what happens, okay? So they, they, you know, basically went down, vacuumed up a bunch of nodules and then left for 26 years. And they came back and it was still bad, okay? So the microbial activities of the cell abundance, abundances were still reduced by half after 26 years. And you have to understand that microbes compose a giant component of the of deep sea sediment. Okay, this is we don't understand how they work. We don't understand um, uh, how they contribute to carbon cycling or to climate change. We don't know what we're doing if we mess that up. Okay, and so last summer the small nation of Nauru, okay, which is in the Western Pacific near one of these nodule beds basically forced the International Seabed Authority's hand and said, you have to come up with um, the rules for seabed mining within the next two years um, because we're gonna start. And it was a, a loophole in a regulation. Um, so that was you know, basically like a few days before I gave this lecture last year. So update, there are more studies. So now there's a new study on noise from deep sea mining showing that you know, noise from one mine alone could, you know, affect 500 kilometers worth of the ocean floor in gentle weather conditions. Okay, and that's bad because everything on the seafloor needs sound. Okay, and the seafloor is not a desert. Um, if I can impress, if I hope I've impressed that upon you. Now, um, and uh, we might still be in this only in this exploration phase, but we only have one year left to negotiate this code, the set of rules that's, that's gonna govern um, seabed mining. And so the International Seabed Authority, which is a UN organization, they are meeting in Kingston, Jamaica right now, this week um, to work on these rules. And this is probably their last meeting this year. Um, so myself and more than 600 of my colleagues have written a letter saying that it is critical that we do not do this that we do not know enough, the environmental impacts are too vast, um, and that this, this is not something that needs to start a year, okay? Because there is a lot of stuff that lives on the bottom of the ocean, okay? Um, you know, and I just picked the, the most charismatic, you know, I didn't even pick the ugly animals, I just picked the prettiest ones. All of these things will be affected by seabed mining, okay? Because I refuse to believe that these machines, which are real, this is not a concept drawing, these were built by Nautilus Minerals. Um, you can see the people in the yellow jackets for scale. Um, I refuse to believe that these machines will not severely affect seabed life and uh, the functional uh, uh, life in, in the deep sea, okay? And so here's, here's a, a good quote. It's a circular reasoning quote. We haven't explored the deep sea because we don't appreciate what a remarkable, mysterious and wondrous place it is and we don't know what an astonishing place it is because we haven't explored it. Chicken and the egg. We are managing to destroy the ocean before we even know what's in it. Okay. And I feel like we've done this so many times with so many other ecosystems and we don't need to repeat it in the ocean. Okay. I'm going to skip this. Okay. So what's underneath the underneath? Okay. We talked about all of these topics today. Okay. There's more questions. What's underneath? More questions. Okay, just like underneath Kakashi Sensei's mask is another mask. Okay, but maybe I should organize them a little bit better. Or maybe I should organize them even a little bit better. 
So you can see all of the things we have talked about today are relevant to not only you as a person, but to this camp. Okay. Okay. I'm going to skip this. And I'm just going to go straight to this because there is always a West Virginia connection. This is from 1979, the first exploration of hydrothermal vents with Alvin. That sounds all right so far. I'm going with that. All right. You can't hear they're singing John Denver's country roads. So there is always West Virginia. There's Alvin descending into the abyss with John Denver playing. Um, and so this is actually the, the guy who's helping putting the tape into the tape play. That's Paul Allen. Um, this is actually what he was known for before the discovery of hydrothermal. Come on, Hulk. Let's drive this thing. And with that, I think I just come in under the wire. <laughs>